So, riffing on some unpublished writings by this guy named Jackson Jennings, let's open up this whole idea of what adaptation is by talking about Superman and Batman and Jesus and really move away what we've been talking about in terms of adaptation from a novel to a film to much larger issues of what adaptation could mean. So, in doing this, why focus on guys like Superman and Batman and Jesus? Well, the first thing is that they all have something very in common, and that is that they're examples of revisionary storytelling. And what's very curious about that kind of storytelling is that revision, or the presentation of a new story, in that sense of telling it again and again and again, is that the actual new installment of the story is more important than suspense, and suspense is of course a keystone of normal sitting down to enjoy a narrative. So when we're watching a Superman film, it's never about, oh my god, what's going to happen next? We always know, or usually know, that Superman is going to win. He'll have some sort of trial, some sort of battle, that'll knock him down pretty hard, but he's going to get back up and win the battle. Now, of course, there's exceptions to this in comics, and when you're thinking about Batman, a lot of marketing is telling us that Batman's going to die in the new next Nolan film, but, you know, we'll see. And even with death, as with the Christ narrative, when a death is coming, we tend to already know that it's coming. So like Titanic, we know the boat is going to sink. And in a Jesus story, we know he's going to die. So these revisionary stories, the issue is never about suspense. It's always about seeing how this familiar story is going to play out this time. That's the draw and that's the attraction. And so when we think about like a novel to film adaptation, you know, this is another area where, assuming you've read the novel or a comic book that you're watching on the screen, the novelty of seeing that adaptation is not really suspense, although there may be all kinds of riveting scenes within the logic of the movie. The actual novelty is seeing the familiar story played out again in a particular way and under particular conditions with a certain actor, certain screenwriter, and so forth. Now, returning to the revisionary characteristics of stories like Batman and Superman and Jesus, let's think a little bit about how this works. One of the concepts we need to look at here is the idea of the trope. And a trope, there's different meanings of what a trope is, but it's typically a common pattern or a theme or some sort of motif in literature or art or film. And there are actually two kinds of trope. There's actantial tropes and actorial tropes get to actorial tropes in a minute, but to start with actantial tropes, I mean, there's a simpler use than actantial. You could call them actants, or more simply, characteristics. So, for example, an actant or actantial trope would be Jesus walking on water. And this is not limited to Jesus, and that's the point here. There's a sort of adaptive fluidity, because Superman could walk on water if he wanted, but instead of doing that, he flies around. But there's a shared element of hovering here, and it's the uh, a shared ability to perform this certain act. And you might say, yeah, 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 but Batman, he doesn't walk on water and he doesn't fly. But he does have these considerable skills as an acrobat, and they are essentially like the ability to fly. They represent flight symbolically. So Superman, Batman, Jesus, and all kinds of other characters, they have this particular accent of flight that they share. Now another example, Jesus does miracles. He can strike water and wine from stones. Superman shoots lasers from his eyes. These are pretty miraculous events. There's different reasons why that they do them. Uh, actually shared ones. Jesus uh, has these miracles because he's the son of God. Superman is the son of Krypton and the figures that he, you know, are his parents, they become symbolic like God because they are from this outer space, basically. Um, so they share that miraculous origin in a godlike sense. And again, you can say, well, Batman doesn't have miraculous powers. But at a symbolic level and the level of an actantial trope, he does. He has this ingenious ability to invent and perform what are essentially technological mir miracles. So, you know, he's got all these toys that let him do miraculous things just as fast as Jesus or Superman would do. And we never really see in the movies the depth of time and experimentation it takes to make those toys. We just know that he had to go through a certain process to get them, if we're even thinking about that. So Batman has 
he shares the actant of being able to do miracles along with guys like Superman and Jesus. And this is one way that adaptation studies could proceed by looking for and looking at patterns like this. And we wouldn't want to just compare Superman and Jesus and Batman, but really hundreds and hundreds of characters who show these kinds of characters and actants in different cultures and at different times. Because the question is, would in looking at all these different stories that appear all over the world about people with these characteristics, are they adaptations of each other? Are they revisions? And if so, how did they travel from place to place? Did they have to go by boat or train or plane or word of mouth or however they got around? There's this, is there actually a need for them to have been transferred physically through actual humans interacting with one another? Um, but there's another way of thinking about it, and it may be that those particular actants, such as flying or doing miracles, and these shared elements are maybe they don't need to be transferred they could come from natural circumstances that force us to tell stories in certain ways so for example surely all cultures have people who have seen birds for instance and all cultures have in some way understood the force of gravity so it should be no surprise that even without having had any contact with other cultures to share stories they would probably come up with the idea of humans transcending gravity the way that birds do and doing all kinds of things that birds do. And this would also go for miraculous things like being able to produce fire and so forth. Well, fire exists. It has to be created in a certain physical process of having two surfaces interact or whatever other ways that fire is produced. But it would not be a stretch for a culture to come up with stories where a human could do this out of nowhere. So it wouldn't necessarily have to get that idea from another culture in order for it to appear. So these elements that appear in storytelling around the world, they may not need transference or adaptation or revision between cultures. They, they can be universal simply because they stem from universal rules that the physical world forces upon us and that we all have to obey. So we said there were two kinds of trope and that was the actantial trope. Now we'll talk about the actorial trope. And the term actorial trope refers to cases where established characters appear in multiple narratives or sequels or remakes or reboots or revisions. Um, and by appearing in multiple ones, it's not just ones that are um, devoted solely to a character. So Superman might appear in a comic book or a television show or a movie that is devoted to his own character, but it's an actorial trope if he shows up in another story. So he shows up in a Batman comic, for instance, or even skipping companies, he shows up in a Spider-Man comic. Um, and, you know, Jesus, he definitely serves as the central character in Mel Gibson's Passion of the Christ, but he travels to all kinds of other stories. He appears in episodes of The Simpsons, he appears in Jesus Christ Vampire Hunter, he's all over the place. So the idea of the actorial trope is that these kind of characters can travel between narratives. And so um, to get some really technical academic language going, what some people would call gobbledygook, we could say that Superman's actantial tropes are actorial whenever both Superman and the characteristics or tropes that define him appear in some other story that belongs outside of the central Superman collection of narratives. Now, what about just referring to Superman or one of these characters? Seinfeld would be a good example. Seinfeld constantly refers to the Fortress of Solitude, to Kryptonite, and to the Bizarros. And these things, too, I think, count as actorial appearances of Superman because they're actually drawing upon his actants or his characteristics and pulling them into another narrative situation. So even though he himself doesn't appear or isn't represented to appear, um, all those characteristics are being referred to and brought into that narrative. So it's not just intertextuality, but it's a means of supporting Seinfeld's character and sort of lending cre credence to Seinfeld's own symbolic ability to perform miracles and fly. Um, but demonstrating the validity of the idea that Seinfeld needs somehow to be uh, connected with Superman and have a show his abilities is uh, the subject of another video. So 
actantial tropes and actorial tropes, useful little terms for thinking about adaptation and extending it beyond just thinking about novels being turned into film. 